Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Dyeratna, and I'm going to talk about the smoke and air mirrors behind integrated assessment modeling. So regarding integrated assessment modeling, which is basically the class of models that the social cost of carbon comes from, there are a bunch of fundamentally important questions to ask. Firstly, how does the government actually come up with the, its energy and climate policies? And secondly, are the tools for doing so even legitimate? So firstly, let me put forth this question, and Dr. Mendelson talked about this. What is the social cost of carbon? Well, in a nutshell, the social cost of carbon is defined by the EPA as the economic damages associated with a metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions. And the general question is, regarding the SCC, what is the long-term economic impact of carbon dioxide emissions summed across a particular time horizon? And there are three main statistical models that are used to get at this question. The DICE model, the FUN model, and the PAGE model. Now, these models are, are basically a series of equations representing economic growth and climate response, and they're estimated via what we call Monte Carlo analysis. The idea is, is that various components of these models are random, so the random components are repeatedly drawn, these stochastic components, through Monte Carlo simulation, and in the long run, we generate a distribution of the SEC from which distributional properties are reported. So, before we go into the details of the SEC, let's just talk about the concept in the first place. They're determined by so-called damage functions, and these are plots from the IWG's Interagency Working Group's 2010 technical support document. And notice there are a bunch of curves here. There's a red and blue curve, which are the dice and the page models, and there's a green curve right there. And if we zoom in, it's the next slide. If we zoom in, and the y-axis, by the way, is damages per unit of GDP, global GDP, and the x-axis is temperature, you notice that the green curve is actually negative. That's because out of the three models, the fund model is the only model that actually allows for benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. The other two models, a priori, only assume that they're costs. So let's keep this in mind as the talk goes on. Now, as with any statistical model, these models are grounded by assumptions. A discount rate, a time horizon, and the specification of what we call an equilibrium climate sensitivity distribution. So we ran two of the three models, the DICE and the FUN models. The PAGE model we didn't run because the author insisted on co-authorship for anything we publish. So we felt that that precluded us from being able to do any independent analysis. So regarding these assumptions, firstly, there's a discount rate. So we talked about economic damages, but the real question is, supposing there actually are damages, what amount should be invested to avert these damages, these so-called damages, from actually occurring in the future? So discount rates are a way to actually do so. And the EPA used 2 and 3 and 5% discount rates, despite the fact that the Office of Management and Budget in Circular A4 specifically stipulated that a 7% discount rate be used as well at a, as part of cost-benefit analysis. So despite the fact that this uh, requirement, the stipulation of a 7% discount rate be used, the IWG ignored it, but we ran it, these models at 7% for them. Now, secondly, there's a specification of a time horizon. So, as I talked about, projected economic damages are summed. But the real question is, for how long? Now, <clears throat> these models attempt to make projections 300 years into the future. Now, if you think about Dr. John Christie's testimony in front of co Congress, the House Science and Tech Committee last year, he juxtaposed temperature extrapolations from IPCC models against actual satellite and weather balloon data. And you can see the stark difference. You look at Dr. Christie's uh, projections based on the IPCC models and the actual data, and these models grossly overpredict temperatures. So when you think about it, these models are trying to make forecasts 300 years into the future. Firstly, we don't know what the economy will look like that far into the future, but when you think about things from a climate perspective, how on earth can they forecast 300 years into the future when they can't even predict 20? Lastly, these models involve the specification of an equilibrium climate sensitivity, or ECS, distribution. Now, global warming alarmists will always tell you, ooh, the science is settled on global warming. But I was talking about this a few weeks ago, and when you really think about it, the phrase settled science, that's an oxymoron. Science is something that's by definition unsettled. 
new studies consistently come to light, bring, improving upon prior studies. And the concept of ECS distributions are no different. They consistently appear in the peer-reviewed literature. And here are four of them. The first distribution, Roe Baker 2007, was published 10 years ago in the journal Science. That's a whole decade ago, and that is the distribution that the IWG wanted to assume. Subsequent distributions, there are a few right here, which, are, which we use in our research. By the way, our research is uh, in the back table over there, and you guys are welcome to pick up copies of each of our papers. Um, <coughs> these newer distributions are distributions that actually suggest lower probabilities of high-end global warming. So don't really want to go too much into the statistics here, but in a nutshell, an ECS distribution represents the Earth's temperature response to a doubling of carbon dioxide emissions. So the question is, okay, suppose carbon dioxide emissions were to double. How much would the Earth warm? Well, the areas under these probability density functions give you the probability that the Earth will warm by a particular amount. So for example, if we look at the yellow curve, which is the outdated Roe Baker distribution, and the area under the curve of four degrees or four and a half degrees Celsius onwards, that will tell you the probability that the Earth's temperature will, will warm by more than four or four and a half degrees in response to a doubling of CO2 emissions. But if you notice this tail probability and you compare it to the other more recent distributions, it's significantly lower. And when you compare it to the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, which we'll spend most of our time talking about today, we actually did our analysis on all the other distributions as well, which is in our research. But if you compare, say, the probability of the Earth's temperature warming by more than, say, four degrees, under the outdated Roe Baker distribution, the probability is slightly under 30%. But under the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, it is significantly lower, about 5 in 100. So what happens if we alter the assumptions that the IWG makes? In particular, we'll talk about what happens if you tweak the discount rate, or the ECS distribution. And this work is joint with my colleague here, Ross McKittrick, as well as David Kreutzer, who is now at the EPA. What if we were to tweak the discount rate and run the 7% discount rate that the IWG ignored? Just using the outdated Roe Baker distribution, we did so in our analysis. And here are the, the results for the DICE model. So in 2020, we noticed a $37.79 estimate of the social cost of carbon under a 3% discount rate. And under a 7% discount rate, we noticed a $5.87 estimate. Now, we also did this analysis using 2.5 and 5%. For brevity, I'm just including 3 and 7. Now, what happens if we use the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution that suggests a lower probability of high-end global warming? Well, if you look at that, even under a 3% discount rate, we notice a $19.66 estimate of the SEC. Under a 7% discount rate, we notice a $3.57 estimate. And if you compare just holding the ECS distribution fixed, how the SEC changes when you use 7% instead of 3%, we notice substantial drops in the SEC by 35 to 45% or so. Even more, actually, depending on the ECS distribution used. Now, the DICE model, so, so suppose, what if we were to change the ECS distribution and keep the discount rate fixed? How much would the results change? Well, here what you notice is that the results change by, you know, about 40 to 50% in the years 2020 and 2050. So now how about the fun model? Again, this is the model that actually allows for benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. Well, under a 3% discount rate using the outdated Roe Baker distribution, we notice a $19.33 estimate of the SEC and a negative 37 cent estimate under a 7% discount rate. And this negativity is, again, very interesting, and I'm, I'm going to get back to this in a bit. But using the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, under a 3% discount rate, we notice a $3.33 estimate of the SEC. And under a 7% discount rate, we notice a negative $1.10 estimate. And now, if you look at the percent changes from just keeping the ECS distribution fixed under <coughs> the, between a 3 and 7% discount rate, we notice substantial drops in the SEC for each year. And now we notice, if we keep the discount rate fixed and we switch the ECS distributions, under a 3 and 7% discount rate, the SEC drops substantially. In the year 2020, under a 7% discount rate, it drops by nearly 200%. So now speaking of the negativity, let's ask a general question. Is global warming necessarily a bad thing? 
That is, are there actually damages associated with carbon dioxide emissions? Well, according to the fund model, the answer is no. And in our analysis, we, uh, we computed the probability of a negative SCC, which would suggest that there are actually benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. And we notice here that under the outdated Roe Baker distribution, under a 3% discount rate, there is a slightly above a 10% chance of the SEC being negative, and it goes up to 60% under a 7% chance. And now, using the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, these probabilities increase substantially. It's nearly 70% under a 7% discount rate using uh, the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution for the year 2020. So now does the madness stop with the SEC? Well, we also did this analysis for the social cost of methane and social cost of nitrous oxide that the federal government also uses. And we also noticed that they are very sensitive to very re reasonable changes in assumptions. Uh, in a similar manner to this, the, those uh, results drop by as much as 80% or more using more up-to-date assumptions. So what if we actually wanted to take these models seriously? Supposing they have legitimacy, which with these results all over the map, you really start to wonder about that. Well, I ran the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change, looking at a hypothetical simulation of eliminating all methane emissions from the United States completely, as well as nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide emissions, just thinking about if we eliminated methane emissions from the United States completely, what would be the impact on global temperatures? So using, looking at these two graphs, the red line is current policy, and the green curve is a hypothetical situation of eliminating all methane emissions from the United States completely. And you'll notice that the curves are virtually identical, except in 2100, we notice a measly 0 0.02 degrees Celsius reduction in global temperatures. What about sea level rise? Well, we also notice in terms of sea level rise, a minuscule reduction. If you were to eliminate methane emissions from the United States completely, there would be around a 0.27 centimeter reduction in sea level rise. And speaking of sea level rise, what assumptions are being made about it in these IAMs? Well, that's a very interesting thing. Um, my friends Pat Michaels and Chip Knappenberger wrote a blog about this two years ago where I extracted sea level rise from the DICE model. And if you look at the sea level rise assumptions that are being made in the DICE model in the year 2300, they exceed the assumptions made by the IPCC, AR5's projected range of sea level rise, which is quite disturbing. Now, what would be the economic impact of taking these models seriously, assuming we were to implement a carbon tax that was commensurate with the SEC, as reported by the IWG? Well, we use the Department of the Heritage Energy Model, which is a clone of the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System, to get at this question. And we notice by 2035, there'd be an average employment shortfall of over 400,000 lost jobs, a total loss of income of over $20,000 for a family of four, a 13 to 20 percent increase in electricity prices, and an aggregate $2.5 trillion loss in GDP. All this for a negligible change in global temperatures of less than 0.2 degrees Celsius change in temperature mitigation. So now somebody asked me a very good question. What impact would these policies have toward shifting toward renewables? Because that's really what many of the advocates of these types of carbon capture, carbon tax policies want. Well, with the heritage energy model, we also looked at this question in terms of energy consumption under current policy, the, here's a pie chart uh, depicting the different types of energies. And the blue component, the, the blue, uh, excuse me, the dark blue, red, and green components are uh, you know, petroleum, coal, and natural gas. The uh, purple component is nuclear. The blue component is renewables, which is a 9% uh, component of the energy portfolio. But now what would happen under the carbon tax scenario would we notice a notable uptick? Well. Slightly, but only up to 14% or so. So if they're looking to you know, induce a shift toward renewables, that's not going to happen. So now let's think about what this tells us. These integrated models are extremely sensitive to very, very reasonable changes in assumptions. The damage functions at their core are arbitrary. In the first place, they don't really have much legitimacy. And out of the three models, two of them all, all, a priori assume that they're costs. The other model can be negative under very reasonable assumptions suggesting that there are more benefits than costs of carbon dioxide emissions. And as a result, with these models being literally all over the maps, you can manipulate them 
to produce any result you want. If you want to hide SCC, all you have to do is use the outdated assumptions that the IWG use, ignore the 7% discount rate, and you get a high SEC. If you want a negative SEC, just use the fund model and update your ECS distributions, and it's going to be more po negative than positive. And moreover, taking these models seriously in terms of the IWG's interpretation of them would result literally in economic disaster with few environmental benefits. So thank you. Happy to take questions at the end.